Hey, and welcome to this demo of uh, installing Recover Point for Virtual Machine 4.0.1. So the first thing you need to do is to enable the iSCSI software adapter, and it's very important to understand that we do not actually need an iSCSI connectivity, just that the virtual RPA that we are going to install on some of the ESX servers is going to use an iSCSI software adapter to connect between the virtual RPA to the E6i kernel. So how do you do it? Well, here I've already enabled them, but let's assume we don't have an iSCSI software adapter enabled. You just go to it and press properties, or you actually go to here, add, add iSCSI software adapter, uh, press OK, and that's about it. Now we have an iSCSI software adapter. The second thing we need to do on the ES6 server that we are going to install recover point for virtual machine uh, RPA appliance is to actually configure an iSCSI VM kernel. So how do you do it? You go to networking. In my case, I have a dedicated card that I'm using for the iSCSI VM kernel. So here you can view the settings. I basically added a VM kernel. How to add a VM kernel? Add VM kernel. You give it an IP address and a name, and that's about it. Here we can investigate my existing iSCSI VM kernel. Nothing really special. We just need to make sure we give it an IP address, a subnet, and a gateway. And that's about it. Now, in production environments, you are very likely to use more than one physical NIC for your iSCSI uh, communication and, 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 and application. So basically, what you will have to do is to create multiple iSCSI NICs like this, where in each one of them you make one physical NIC as the primary NIC, and then the other one will be an unused adapter. In my case, I have only one NIC, so there is only one adaptive adapter. The last thing we need to do is to configure the iSCSI itself. So what you need to do is go back to the storage adapter. After we've enabled the iSCSI software adapter, press the properties. And here what we need to do is basically tell the iSCSI software adapter which NICs to use. And here we can also enable multipathing for iSCSI. So after we've enabled the physical NICs, we created the iSCSI software adapter. We created the VM kernel. Here we can see the VM kernel itself, and really, uh, to edit, it's very easy. You just press the Add button, and you add the iSCSI NIC. In my case, I already added it, so there is no additional NIC to add. That's about it. Really, nothing here is special. It's all the usual uh, iSCSI stuff, and again, it has nothing to do with uh, how you position the volumes, present the volumes from the Extreme IO array to Recover Point for Virtual Machines. Those can be via fiber channel, iSCSI, whatever. Recover Point for Virtual Machines supports every storage that is out there. It can be even a DAS for, for all it matters. So the iSCSI connectivity here is only internal. Now that we've done it, and I've also did it on the other ES6 server here, we need to actually deploy the RPA. So how do you deploy it? You stand on the ES6 server that you want to deploy it on, file, deploy OVF template, my case, I'm running this version, 152. So here, next, next, accept, next. This can, of course, be done from the web interface as well. Here I can select the RPVM configuration. This will really depend on the site the, large, the number of VMs that you want to protect, the bandwidth that you want to achieve. Uh, so in large sites, I would recommend you to use eight virtual CPUs and eight gigabyte of RAM per recover point for virtual machine appliance. So that's what I'm going to select. Here I've already created some data stores, so we can actually repeat it now. What's important to create in each extreme IO site as a minimum are four volumes. The first volume is where we are actually going to deploy the recover point for virtual machines to, so just the data store. You don't need a lot of capacity. The second one is where recover point for virtual machine will actually restore its configuration after I configure it, known as the repo, a repository volume. So again, it can be a very small uh, data store. And the other are uh, one that will depend on how many VMs you want to protect. So for example here, since this is my target recover point of virtual machine site, I need at least one VMFS data store. This needs to be as a read and write data store. It's not a traditional storage replication, so the VMFS needs to actually be presented 
to the ESX servers. And lastly, I also configure the journal volume, recover point, whether it's the physical or virtual stores, it's metadata changes on the journal. So think about the journal like a TiVo box, where you, it actually saves all of your data and, and point in times, and then you can select from whatever point in time that you want to. That, that's exactly the journal in our case. So here I'm just installing RP4 VMs. I'm going to select the OVA data store that I already created, press the next button, in my case, I make it a thin provision VM, and those networks have already been configured. I'm going to give it a fixed uh, IP. So here you can see the IPs that I gave the RPA. It's very useful to get, get yourself. Here you can see all the IP addresses that I'm going to use for this virtual RPA. It's really useful for you before the deployment to have something like a cheat sheet, the one that I'm using. So for example, here I'm about to deploy this virtual RPA. So I have different IP addresses that I'm going to designate during the deployment and after the deployment. For example, it's LAN IP. Then the iSCSI LAN interfaces that I'm going to use, the VM kernel that I've used on that host. And also the floating IP that I will use to manage the cluster itself and lastly the one IP for that specific uh, RP4 VM appliance. To each one of them you need to basically have those IP addresses. So again, very useful to have these uh, in advance. So here I'm just going to go back to the OVA deployment and actually deploy the RP4 VM appliance. And now that this is done I can already start deploying the other RPA for the other ESX server. One of the benefits of RecoverPoint for virtual machines is that you do not actually need to deploy a virtual RPA appliance per an ESX that you want to protect. In fact, you can actually have a couple of ESX servers that you deploy RP4 VMs that will protect other ESX clusters that do not have the RP4 VM appliance installed on them. Very, very useful because you don't need to have the OVA per ESX server like other products. So here I'm deploying the OVA. Same steps will be needed. It will ask me for uh, IP addresses that I've showed you before. Just give it a name. The configuration folder before VM appliance. The data store that I'm going to install it on. And that's about it. Okay, now that I've deployed the first two RP4 VMs, I need to actually configure them as a cluster. So what I need to do is open a browser and browse into one of the IPs of the RP4 VMs that I deployed in the, in the semi 6 cluster, forward slash WDM, capital WDM, and browse to it. And here I will be logged in automatically. And now that I'm logged in, what I will need to do is use the new web interface to actually connect those two RP4 VMs to a RecoverPoint for Virtual Machine cluster. So how do you do it? You press the install a VRPA cluster. Here you have the multiple option. You can basically install the license or you can go with the try and buy, which is what we're going to use. Another useful feature is to actually import a JSON configuration file if you've already did it in the past. And then, let's say that you formatted your environment and you want to redeploy everything, you will not need to manually re-input all the IPs again. So you can actually import and export a JSON file that you may have used from a different deployment. And I'm just going to press the next button. It asks me for an IP address, username, password of the virtual center that I'm deploying it on. So this is the DRV center that I'm deploying the RP4 VMs for. So I've already entered those IPs. And I'll press the retrieve SSL. RP4 VM uses SSL, so it automatically founds it. Press the OK button. Another, another useful feature of this release is the run validation test. So it will basically try to run validation on the environment that I'm deploying uh, the cluster on. So here we can see that everything is good. No problems have been identified so far. So I can press the next button. And now it actually asks me for those uh, IP addresses. So again, 
very useful will be to have the cheat sheet that uh, I created beforehand and just uh, input those uh, IPs. Okay, just fill them up all. By default, it allows you to configure two uh, RP4 VMs uh, virtual appliances. However, you can add more. We support up to eight virtual RPAs per cluster. Let's also export this file so it will be useful for me if I'm going to format the environment and redeploy it. So that's the file. You can rename it, for example. So I will know that this is the target RP4 VMs. There you go. And now we can actually start with the deployment itself. Press the next button. It asks me what should be the name for the target RP4 VMs cluster. So I'm just going to name it target. Let's use the DNS server. This is important. So here we can select the security level. Whatever security level that you're using, you need to make sure that the other RP4 VM cluster that you deploy or are about to deploy will have the same security level. So I'm going to use accessible security level here. And here we select where to actually store the repository configuration that we talked about before. So that's the volume that I'm going to select and press install. And from this moment on, it's pretty much uh, automatic it will do all the tests for you. It will actually deploy the VIP file that it's going to use at the ES6 Viscasi or in the upcoming version, the IOF filters to deploy it on onto the ES6 kernel. If you open the vCenter, you can actually monitor the progress of the deployment itself. So things like the VIP installation will be shown here or if you're using the web interface, they will be shown in the web interface. Here we can see the VIP is starting to get installed. Okay, and we can now see that the deployment was successful. So, Okay, the next thing we need to do is to connect between the different VRPA clusters. So what you see here is that I've logged in into the first cluster IP, backslash forward slash WDM, and I can see this GUI, so the cluster is connected to the vCenter, and now I'm actually going to connect it to the remote cluster. So I'm going to press connect VRPA clusters, accept the policy, press the next. Here it asks me for one of the one interfaces IPs of one of the RP4 VMs virtual appliance at the remote site. So since I'm at the local site, at the sole site, I'm just going to scroll down to my cheat sheet and select one of the RP4 VMs one interface IP. So in my case, it's this one. I'm going to copy paste it here. Some other more advanced option is that if you're running a different network at the remote site, for example, or the source, it depends where you connect those VRPIs to and from. You can designate a different subnet and a different gateway, which is actually quite common considering the fact that many customer sites will have a different subnet at the DR site versus the production sites. So here are the places where you configure those settings. However, in my case, since I'm using just a stretch VLAN lab, I don't have a need to configure a different gateway. So I'm just going to press the connect button and the connection will actually start. And there you go, the two clusters are now connected and if I will press the finish button, I will actually be able to watch it from the main screen here. There you go, I can now see that those two clusters are connected. So the next module will focus around protecting an actual VM.